Man, I'm excited about today as we were planning out the summer, as we were kind of planning out, mapping out the rest of this series in preparation for Pastor Richie to take a few Sundays off, which I'm so glad that he can take a few Sundays off, get the rest that he needs so he can be empowered and in tune with what God has for us moving forward. We are progressing into some interesting times, to say the least, and so some extra prayer, some extra rest is needed always, and so as we were planning and preparing for this, we kind of picked this day to say, hey, you know, Jonathan, you're going to speak on this day, and so like I always do, kind of went to God and said, all right, what, what is it that you have? You know, kind of had a topic in mind of, of being bold, being courageous, and, and so I started reading, I started praying, and God led me to this passage that we led, read a minute ago. An all too familiar passage. I grew up in the church. My dad's a pastor. I've, I've been in church since nine months before I was born. I was there, all right? I was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all the nights, all the nights we had church, I was there. And, I, and I've heard this passage read so many times, but as I started to read it, God's spirit started to speak to me. He started to show me things that I hadn't seen before. And that, that's crazy, right? I know a lot of you that probably do Bible studies, you do quiet times at home. God will speak to you through his word because his word's alive and it's active, right? It wasn't just for, for one moment in time, but God's word speaks to us again and again, even through passages that we read over and over again. And so as I read this passage, God started to speak. And I just knew right away that he was like, this is the one. I've got something in here. So I started to dig, started to, to read and to prepare and really, God gave me two questions I want to pose for us today. Two questions I want to wrap today around. And they're on the screen, so if you're taking notes, if you're a nerd, you can write these down. If not, you can take notes um, just in any way possible. Take a picture of it if you have to. Um, whatever you need to do, write these questions down because I want you processing this. I don't want this just to be, you know, 35 minutes, which I can see is already really counting down again away from me. And so we've got 35 minutes, but I don't want it just to be here. I want us to take these questions with us. This is homework, right? This is homework. How many of you remember school? I don't even know if school is still a thing anymore. I don't even know if we're, if we're ever going to have school again. But I know parents in the house are like, please have school, you know, get them out of my house. But anyway, here's homework for us today. Two questions. What has God called you to do? What has God called you to do? That's question number one. Question number two is, what are you afraid of? What has God called you to do? And what are you afraid of? Because you see in this passage, the first thing I kind of noticed is that God gave Moses a mission. He called him to do something, right? I even said, y'all say that with me. He said, so now, go. He gave him a mission. He gave him something to do. He gave him something to accomplish. And so God gives us all a mission. If we're saved, if we're called by him, he's got a calling for your life. He's got a calling for my life. That might be something that's overarching over your whole life, or it could be the season that you're in. He's called us all to something. He's given us all a mission. And right, when we have a mission, that means we're, we're trying to accomplish something. There's something on the other side. There's something we're trying to achieve. And so he is trying to use us and work through us to accomplish great things for his kingdom. And he's given us all a mission. Now, some of you might be confused. You might not quite know what that is. That's okay. That's why it's a question. That's why it's homework, to kind of go home and pray, God, what have you called me to do? And then the second question is, what am I afraid of? And so God gave Moses a mission. And when he gives us a mission, when he gives us a calling, he gives us all the necessary tools to accomplish that mission. He's not going to set you out to do something that you can't do. He's going to give you the gifts, the talents, the abilities, whatever it takes to accomplish that mission for his glory. And so he's given us all a mission. He's given you the gifts to, uh, to, to accomplish it. And the other thing I saw here, and we're going to look back a little bit on Moses' life, is that this wasn't a new mission. This wasn't new to Moses. When, when, when God found Moses and met him at the burning bush and he said, so now go, this wasn't a new mission. This wasn't a new calling. This was something, as we're going to see when we look back, Moses had encountered this calling before. And so just because context is king, I was joking with somebody this week as I was preparing this and kind of talking through it and processing it. I'm like, man, I feel like when I speak, we always, we're covering chapters. 
You know, a lot of times, you know, we, we sit down and we might just have a verse or two we kind of dig through on a Sunday morning. But when I preach, I feel like we're always walking through chapters because I think what's important here is that context is king. We have to understand something in Moses' past to understand what God's trying to do right now in the present. And so let's look back at Moses' life. In Exodus chapter 2 is where Moses' life starts. In Exodus chapter 2, so the Israelites, they're in bondage. They've been enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. And Moses is born. And when Moses is born, there is a death sentence on him. Because here was the rule. Is the Israelites were starting to multiply so much that Pharaoh said, hey, every boy that's born is to be thrown into the river. To be thrown into the river. So Moses was born. He had a death sentence on his head. He wasn't even supposed to make it to one year old. You know, he had the odds stacked against him. And some of you here today, you feel like, man, I've got the odds stacked against me. Man, I am up against it. You don't know where I come from. You don't know my past. You don't know the situation that I was born into. But I tell you, it's not much worse than this. I can guarantee you when you're born, someone wasn't trying to throw you in the river. But here's the thing I want us to understand, that sometimes the greater the opposition we come against, the greater the opportunity that God has for us on the other side. Amen. The greater the opposition you might be up against, the more the devil's coming at you, the more things you struggle with, the, the greater the storm, the, the deeper the valley. God's got something special for you on the other side because sometimes the greater the opposition against us, the greater the opportunity he has for us. And so let's realize that Moses was destined for great things. And the devil was at it before he even came out of the womb. He was trying to put him in the river and do away with it. But God had a plan, and he had a purpose, and he had something he was going to do through Moses' life. And so Moses' mother put him in a basket in the river, and he floated down the river. Crazy story. Floated down the river, and Pharaoh's daughter picked him out of the river and took him in as her own. So now Pharaoh, the guy that was trying to kill Moses, is now feeding them. <laughs> Moses is in the palace. He's living the high life. He's destined for greatness. And so here he is. He's living in Pharaoh's house, living in the palace. And he lived there for 40 years. For 40 years, Moses grew up. He was being groomed to be the next Pharaoh. He was groomed for greatness. He was treated as Pharaoh's own son. And then one day, things changed. When he was 40 years old, Let's look in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. If you're highlighting stuff in your Bible today, highlight in this verse the words watched. Or maybe your translation says to look on. Because that's not just to see with your own eyes. That word actually means to see with emotion. Something clicked inside Moses' mind when he looked out that day. It was different than before. God gave him a burden for his people. God broke his heart for his people. And so Moses, like any young, zealous person, he's like, all right, I'm going to conquer the world. He sets out, and he sees an Egyptian beating his own people. And he tries to go about it in his own strength, and we're going to see that in a minute. But I think what we need to take here is that, that Moses' heart was broken. When God gives you a calling, when he gives you a mission, he breaks your heart for something. So another question you might even ask yourself as you're processing this later is, what, God, what, what breaks my heart? What breaks my heart? I remember a long time ago I was in a conference as I was preparing for ministry, as, you know, I was, I was coming up. And I love conferences. They're kind of like camp when you're younger, right? You kind of get away from it all, and God kind of speaks in a unique way because all the distraction is gone. And I remember sitting at this conference years and years ago, and Pastor Andy Stanley, if you're not familiar with him, he pastors North Point Church up in the north side of Atlanta. And he's one of the greatest communicators of our generation. And he has a way of just doing things really, really simple. And I kind of stole a little bit of his idea this morning for this message. But when I was in that conference, he asked two questions. <laughs> he asked two questions. He said, what's your name? And then his second question was, what breaks your heart? And I remember sitting there in that conference, and I was like, well, I know my name. I know, I know that. That's an easy one. All right, check that off. You know, at least I might make a 50 on this test at worst. And so, all right. And so I know my name. What breaks my heart? That was tougher, right? 
Because sometimes we, we know what breaks our heart, but we might not have words put to it. We might not have it phrased out quite eloquently. But I believe that's really, really important because as we go through life, when we come up against hard times, we need to know, God, what mission have you called me to? What breaks my heart? And so today, maybe you don't know what that is. That, that'd be something to kind of sit down and figure out, you know, as you're, as you're processing, God, what have you called me to? Well, maybe it's what breaks your heart. Maybe it's what breaks your heart. Just like Moses looked out one day and God flipped a switch in him and broke his heart for his people. And so Moses, in verse 12, it goes on. It says, looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and then he hit him in the sand. See, God put a burden on Moses' heart. The problem here is that he tried to go about it his own way. Tried to go about it his own way. He said, all right, I see a problem. God, you've broken my heart, and I'm going to do something about it. And he went out and he killed the guy. You know, right? So that's a lesson for us, right? Whenever we, God breaks our heart, let's just not go out and kill somebody, okay? That's not permission today to go out and kill somebody, you know? Um, so Moses tried to go out about it his own way. See, his motive was right, but his method was wrong. His motive was right, but his method was wrong. He was right for wanting to see his people delivered from oppression. But deep down, he really wanted to be their deliverer. Scripture even tells us that in the New Testament that Moses was trying to do this so they would see him as their deliverer. But God said, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. Yes, I might use you, but I'm the deliverer. It's not about us. It's not about Moses. It's about what God wants to do. And when we get out of line, he corrects us. And so Moses had a plan with a human perspective, but God had a plan with a heavenly perspective. Moses stepped out of line. He tried to solve the issue on his own power, and God said, no, it's through my power that you're going to accomplish this. And just for time's sake, I'm going to skip this verse. So you guys in the back, you can skip this verse. Um, but the story goes on. He kills the Egyptian. He hides him in the sand, and basically he's found out. Pharaoh finds out. And then now he's got another you know, price on his head. Pharaoh's now after Moses again. And so Moses flees Egypt at 40 years old, and he heads to Midian. Moses sets up camp in Midian, and he's there for another 40 years. He becomes a shepherd. He's, he's, he's gone from the palace. That has passed, and now he finds himself in the pasture. He's gone from the, the loftiest of positions to the lowliest of positions. See, Moses spent the first 40 of his years of his life becoming somebody, and now he's going to spend the next 40 years of his life becoming nobody. He's going to spend the next 40 years of his life becoming nobody. The, the number 40 in the Bible, you, you run into it a lot. If you read scripture a lot, you run into this number often. It's, a, it's associated with a time of testing, Associated with a time of testing. And so Moses here, he's spending the next 40 years of his life in Midian. God's preparing him for his purpose. He's preparing him for his future. You know, Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. God was preparing him, his own son, for the mission that he had for him to accomplish. The Israelites spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. So this number 40 is associated with a time of testing. And now Moses is being put to the test. He was being prepared for his future. He's being prepared for the purpose that God had for him. See, preparation takes time. Preparation takes time. A lot of us, we live in a microwave generation, right? We want our food nuked, and we're at it, and we're out the door, and we're done. See, we want things right now. We want things right now. Our music is at our fingertips. You know, we want to be able to send text messages. And how is it when your spouse doesn't answer that text message right away? You're like, what, what is going on? Answer my text message. We want things now. We want things right away. We're very impatient. But God doesn't function that way. See, preparation takes time. And a lot of times the thing that he's preparing you for, the greater the mission, the longer that preparation time might take. Moses spent 40 years preparing for the mission. 40 years after his heart was burdened, 40 years after God called him and really gave him a, a burden for his people, it was 40 years later that God finally showed up and said, now you're ready. Now we can go for it. And that's where we find ourselves in our passage today. We've kind of gone full circle. Now we're back where we started. But I think that sets up a picture of where Moses' mindset is when God shows up in that burning bush. 
We have a picture of where Moses is at. He spent 40 years of his life. God gave him a burden for his people. He tried to do it. It didn't work out so well. Pharaoh tried to kill him. Now I've moved to Midian. I've been there for 40 years. I've, I've gotten married. Now I've got kids. Now I've got responsibilities. Now I've got a new life. And now God, now you're ready. Now you're ready. Now you're going to show up. And so when God says, now go and set my people free, go and rescue my people, Moses' response back to him is, well, who am I? Who am I? God, I tried this before. God, I tried to answer the call. I tried to do what you called me to do. I tried to accomplish the mission that you called me to, but it didn't work out so well. So now I'm here. I'm 40 years older. I've got a gut. I don't have the energy I had. I've got a bunch of kids running around. I can't do that. I can't do that. But see, what God wanted to do in Moses' life is he wanted Moses to understand that it's not through Moses' power that he's going to accomplish great things. It's through God's power. That's what he wants to teach us. And so we see when, when Moses is tending his flock in the wilderness there in Midian, God shows up in the burning bush. And Moses asks, well, who am I? Who am I? to accomplish this. See, Moses had forgotten who he was. And I believe God really wants us to get to a point where we forget who we are. We forget how to do things on our own because he wants us to rely on his strength. He wants us to do it his way. He wants to work through us. And so Moses is finally at a point where he's like, who am I? I'm not, I'm not capable of doing this. I'm the wrong guy. I, I must have had it wrong. My, my wires might, must have been crossed when you gave me that burden 40 years ago. I'm, I'm not the right person for the job. And God says, now you're ready. Now you're ready. Now you're ready. Now you are clay in my hands. You're clay that I can mold, that I can work with, that I can use to do great things. And so Moses is questioning that. And he says, who am I? Who am I to do this? And here, notice God's response. And this is, man, when I read this several weeks ago, when the Spirit spoke, he said, this is powerful. Moses said, well, who am I? Same question we're asking ourselves in this series, right? Well, who am I? God, who is it that you say I am? And God's response is this, he says in verse 12. He said, I will be with you. I will be with you. See, God wasn't concerned about who Moses really was. He didn't really answer Moses' question. He said, you're asking the wrong question. If you're asking who you are, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am. And it matters that I am with you. So if I've given you a calling, if I've given you a mission, you're going to accomplish it not because of who you are, but because of who I am. Because of who I am. And I will be with you. God was trying to tell Moses, if you're going to accomplish great things, it doesn't matter who you are. What matters is that I will be with you. And so some of you today, you're trying to maybe, maybe you know what that, that calling is on your life. Maybe you know what God's called you to do. Maybe you, you, you know what he's burdened your heart for and you're going after. You're trying to do great things and it's just not working out in your timing. But God says it doesn't matter because I'm with you. I'm with you. See, when we get to a point where we forget our own strength, that's when we have to start relying on his strength. We can't do it on our own. Yeah, we might have some things that we can do, but in the end, it's gonna be futile. It's not gonna work out quite like we want it to. And quite frankly, it's not gonna work out like God wants it to. We need to rely on his strength. Have to rely on his strength. See, the moment that I walk out on this stage, to, to speak, to lead worship, to do anything. The moment I walk out here in my own strength is the moment I need to sit down. Because it's God that works through us. 
It's God that, that uses us. We're just, we're just tools in his hand. We're just, we're just clay that he's wanting to mold into a tool that he can use to multiply his kingdom, to bring breakthrough in people's lives, to work miracles. We're, we're just being used by him. We are vessels for his power. We are a conduit for his capacity. And see, church, what you need to know is that my capacity is worthless, but his is limitless. I am worth nothing on my own. You are worth nothing on your own. It's through his power and his power alone that we accomplish anything. We have to be a conduit for his capacity. We have to pass his power through us if we're going to do anything, because he is limitless. Write that down today. If you're joining us online, write that in the chat that God is limitless. Put it in all caps if you have to. Believe that today, that God is limitless. We can keep saying that. Do we believe that, church, that God is limitless? Because if we don't believe that God is limitless, we might as well go home. That is why we are here. That is who we worship. That is the God that we serve. If we don't believe that today, if we don't believe that today, then we've got a problem. We, we can't sit here and sing, God, you're, you are my champion if we don't really believe that his power is limitless. That's just empty words. That's empty praise. We have to believe it deep down. We have to get to a point where we know that it's not through our strength, it's not through our ability, it's through his ability alone. It's through his power because he is limitless. His strength is limitless. And until we get that, we're going to be held back. We're going to be a cap on our own ministry. We're never going to accomplish the mission that he has for us if we don't believe that today. Philippians 2.13 says this. It says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God works in you. God works in you. He's working through you. You're just a conduit. I'm just a vessel. I'm just a tool. Sometimes we tell people, man, you're just a tool. This is a good, this is a good thing. And you're just a tool. Okay, I'll take it. God's going to use me and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with putting my, my passions aside, putting my strength aside, putting my convictions aside to step into the strength that he has for me. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being a tool today because I know I can do immeasurably more through his power than I ever could do on my own. So God's called us. God's called us to a mission God's called us to be bold. He's called us to be fearless. He's called us to be courageous. He's called us to have confidence, just like that song said, that I am confident, that I am confident. But see, some of us need to move away from self-confidence into God confidence. We need to get out of our self-help classes, and we need to get in God's word. We need to start listening to God speak his confidence into us. We need to get away from self-confidence, stop believing in yourself and start believing in God. Start believing in what God can do through you. Because you're gonna be limited unless you believe that God is limitless. Oh, that's good, that's good. I love the words of John the Baptist. It's a prayer that I, I pray often, or pray often, especially when we're back here, we're preparing for a Sunday morning to come out here. John the Baptist prayed this when Jesus came on the scene. It's up on the screen. He said, he must increase. He's talking about Jesus. See, up until that point, John the Baptist had the ministry. John the Baptist is the one baptizing. He was the one pointing people to the coming Messiah. Now the Messiah is on the scene. Now Jesus is there. He's present. He's in person. And John the Baptist takes a step back. He says, my job is done. He must increase, but I must decrease. That has to become our prayer. That has to become our heart. If we're ever gonna accomplish the mission that God has for us, we have to pray that prayer. He must increase and I must decrease. He must become greater, I must become less. We have to pray that prayer. We have to pray that prayer. 
So the story goes on. Moses is there at the burning bush, and God calls him. He says, no, go. I want to use you to set my people free. I want to use you to deliver my people. Moses says, who am I? God says, I will be with you. It doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am. It matters that I'm with you and I'm present. Still wasn't good enough for Moses. So just to summarize, Moses goes on in the chapter following. And he starts to ask all these questions. Asking questions is okay. It's okay. I've asked you to ask questions. So go home, process that. Talk to God about it. Journal about it. Ask God, what have you called me to do? It's okay. And it's okay to question if God's telling you to do something that seems impossible because all things are possible with God. It's okay if it seems insurmountable, if it seems something you can't accomplish on our own, that usually means we're barking in the right direction because God wants to do something great in your life. He wants to do something great in your life. He wants to do something great in my life. So we have to believe that. And so Moses starts asking some questions of God. He starts asking, well, how will they know who I am? He says, God, well, I can't speak very well. He starts giving excuses. And, and after the questions, he finally just ends up saying, God, just send somebody else. Just send somebody else. Obviously, you've got the wrong number. Obviously, you meant to send this to somebody else that was more capable. I can't do it. And basically, God just says, shut up. Shut up, I've heard enough. How many of you can relate to that? Like you have kids and, and they're talking to you, they're talking to you, talking to you, and you finally, maybe it's your spouse, I don't know. And they say, they're just talking to you, and you're finally just like, shut up. And God tells them something. And really, before we get to that, you have to understand this. So when God, when Moses was asking God those questions, how, how will they know who I am? God works some miracles through this shepherd staff that Moses is holding. He's got this shepherd staff, the tool of the trade when you're a shepherd. Moses was holding that and God told him to throw it on the ground and you know it turned into a serpent and he picked it back up and it turned back into a, into a staff again and God worked all these miracles and so he's holding this staff. And so in Exodus chapter four, verse 17, at the very end, God says, I've heard enough, be quiet. You're the man for the job. I don't wanna hear any more. I just want you to go. And God said this, he said, but take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. God says, take the staff as a reminder that I'm with you, that I'm with you. And hold that staff and know that it's not through any ability of your own, but it's because I am with you. Don't leave it at home. Don't leave it here. Take it with you wherever you go because I am going to do great things through it. Some of us here today just need to be reminded that God is with us, that God is with us. We feel like we can't do it on our own, that we'll never get through this pandemic, that we'll never get another job, that we'll never step into the purpose that God has for us. But what we need to be reminded of today is that God is with us. So he says, don't forget the staff that is in your hand because that is gonna be a reminder to you that I am with you. I'm with you. I just need you to be used by me. I need you to be available. I need you to be ready to be used by me and whatever I call you to do. We like to say around here, one of our key slogans and phrases is your greatest ability is availability. Your greatest ability is availability. Your greatest ability is not something that you can do, but it's the fact that you can be used to let God do something through you. And I don't know what that looks like. That's unique for you. It's unique for me. It's different for each and every one of us, but God's called us all to do something. And he wants us to remember that he's with us. So church, what, what has he called you to do? And what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? That's our questions for today. That's what God is asking. That's got what God wants to speak into your life today. What has he called you to do? And what are you afraid of? Because it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who is with you. One last scripture as I was kind of 
wrapping up, preparing for this message. I don't know. It hit me in the shower. And please don't let your mind wander this morning, but I was in the shower. I do a lot of thinking in the shower because that's one of those areas where it doesn't take a lot of thought to take a shower. You know, it's just something that you got to do hopefully every day. And so I was taking a shower the other day thinking about this message and God kind of reminded me of this verse in Matthew chapter 28. Another familiar passage where Jesus is finishing his mission on earth. Yeah, Jesus had a mission too. Jesus had a calling on his life. It was to go to the cross and to die for you and me. We all have a calling. And so he's finished his. And he's about to leave his disciples for the last time. And I love these verses. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, what? Come on. Therefore, go. (laughs) I've got a mission for you. I've got one more calling for you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, our calling might look different than the person sitting next to you. Your mission might look a little different than, you know, the person that you work with. But we all have a mission. We all have a calling. But really, it all is to make disciples. God's called us to make disciples. So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you sometimes. Oh, wait. It's a typo. Jesse, I don't think that's right. It's not right, right? He says, surely I am with you on Sundays, during the worship service, when you're singing champion. No. He's not saying, surely I am with you when you're on the mountain, but when you're in the valley, I'll catch you on the other side. No, that's not what he's saying. Surely I am with you always. I love this because I felt like the Spirit was telling me, he was like, well, we told Moses that I'll be with you. Jesus is saying, I will be with you always. Not just when the bank account's full, not when you have a good job, not when it seems like everything is working out the way you want it to work out, not when coronavirus ends, not when all this is behind us. No, I am with you always. I am with you always always. Write that down today. I am with you always. Put it in all caps if you have to. Write it in the chat this morning. Blow it up. Say, I am with you always. And believe it today. Don't just write it down. Don't just hear my words and walk out of this place. But know that when you leave this place, God is with you. He's not just here. There's nothing special about these four pretty dark black walls. There's nothing special about this place. What's special about God is that he is with you. He dwells inside of you and he is with you always, always. God doesn't need to social distance. He doesn't need to stay six feet away. He doesn't need a mask on. He is with you always. He is walking beside you at all times. He is in the car with you. He is in the cubicle whenever he is speaking to you to speak to that person next to you working tomorrow. He is with you telling you to share the good news of Jesus with somebody. He is with you when you are parenting your kids. He is with you when you are at school. Wherever you find yourself, God is with you always, always. Not just on the mountain, not just when the seas are calm, but when the seas are stormy, he's with you. And I don't know who needed to hear this today. I know I needed to hear it when I was preparing this. Because sometimes we need to be reminded of our calling. This is not something to take lightly. This is something to process. This is something to work through and to wrestle with. Just like Moses at that burning bush wrestled with God. He asked every question under the sun. He he lacked the faith to step into the strength that God had for him. It's okay to wrestle. That's what I'm asking you to do, to take these questions, to work through them. 
Because here's the, here's the truth, is that God hasn't called you, he hasn't called me to change the world on our own. But if we each step into the calling he has for us, then we will change the world. We will change the world. That's what he's called us to do. He's called us to make disciples. And so today, what has he called you to do? Try to be specific when you work through this. What has God called you to do? And what are you afraid of? God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is alive and it is active and it is speaking to hearts right now. God, speak to us right now. Show us what it is that you have for us. Show us what it is that you want to do through us. God, help us to open up our hearts, to open up our hands, to say, I am available to be used by you. Whatever it is that you have called me to do, whatever burden you have placed on my life, I want to accomplish it. Not for my glory, God, but for your glory. God, help us to pray that today. God, I know you're speaking to lives. I know you're speaking to people. I know your spirit's speaking to me right now. May we not take this lightly. God, would you do a work in our lives? We promise to give you all the glory and all the praise for what you're going to do. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.